All right. Hello and welcome to the channel. Um, of course, yeah, you know who I am already, so uh, we're just going to jump into it. Uh, this is a prep video that I've been wanting to do for some time. Um, somebody asked me, you know, how do I prepare for a campaign? Uh, they're pretty vague in their, um, they're really pretty vague in their question. So I wanted to cover the whole thing in depth and the video just kept growing longer and longer and longer than what I wanted it to be. So I'm just going to cut it in half um, and do the, this part for Dungeon Masters and another part for players. So today we are discussing how to prepare for a uh, Dungeons and Dragons session and how to prepare for a Dungeons and Dragons campaign. Um, this video is going to be from the Dungeon Masters perspective and then uh, next week I'll put out one for players. All right, so you're a dungeon master. Uh, you've just gone through the rigmarole of setting up your world. Uh, if you know you've been following the channel, hopefully you watch uh, that world building video that I have, and I should probably shrink shrink my face down a little bit. There we go. We'll uh, just shrink that like that. That feels appropriate. Um, anyways, if you have watched that uh, world building video, you have your setting or at least uh, enough pieces of it to get started. Um, so you're a dungeon master and you're getting ready for a campaign. If you watch any videos about um, storytelling, writing a story, writing a novel, writing anything like that, they'll always tell you start with a, de a destination in mind. And it's a fundamental element of good storytelling, like everything needs to be building to uh, that moment, that point. But it is so contradictory to how D&D functions that you can have a direction in mind, um, you can have a destination in mind, and uh, never see it and still have one of the greatest campaigns of your life. Um, and that is, a, while it's an important element of storytelling, it's a less important element of Dungeons & Dragons, which is all about storytelling. So um, that can be a little bit confusing, so I want to dive into what really, you know, makes a uh, campaign and how to get started uh, creating one. So if you have a homebrew, if you uh, have a module, of course, and uh, something that Wizards has put out, uh, you don't need anything other than, you know, that module, the player's handbook, and maybe the Dungeon Master's Guide, and everything you need should be listed right there. You just read through the module, it'll, um, you know, tell you every step that you need to take uh, getting ready for this game and then running it. But um, if you have a homebrewed setting and you have this great fantasy world that you've created and you want to make a campaign inside of it and you're looking to tell some type of story, where do you start? Well, at the heart of storytelling, resides uh, conflict, um, characters, and setting. Uh, at the true heart of storytelling, it's conflict and characters, and those are a result of your setting. Um, your conflict erupts because, you know, of something happening in your setting. Your characters exist because of their setting. Um, the character, you know, even if the setting's not uh, exactly tied to the character, you know, your character is there being an element of the story because somebody told them to go to this castle and wrestle, rescue this person, even though they might have no ties to the castle or like have never seen it before. So I was wondering, um, I wanna tackle each of these in these, this video, and I was wondering which one of these uh, is more important. And I couldn't decide to do characters first or last. Uh, they all have a pretty even weight, but there's certain elements of them that get a little bit nuanced when you're uh, prepping for something that I, in my personal style, put over um, the other two. So I'm going to start with characters. Um, characters should be uh, one of the uh, first thing um, you think of in your story. And this is going to be a weird element for Dungeon Masters because you control 99% of like all the characters in this world, in this setting except for the player characters, which you have no control over. Uh, well, you have a slight control over, you know, like what uh, defines them as, you know, they're rolling up for the world. Uh, but other than that, their actions, their backstory, all of that, you don't have any control over that. And uh, it's very, um, it's going to be very interesting seeing how that uh, interacts with your story. But everybody else in the world, um, not everybody, but at least the main characters to... Um, the main characters, your world leaders, your religious leaders, uh, the people that your party members are going to be talking to right off the bat, 
uh, characters have backstory. Um, they don't have all have to be like tragic backstory or anything like that, but they have a history. Uh, oftentimes, uh, and once again, I'll say 90% of the time, uh, characters exist before the story even starts. Before ye the camera ever pans in on that end scene, those characters have existed, you know, in that town or in that setting for some amount of time, oftentimes before the story starts. Um, so things to think about is, you know, what's the reason to, uh, what's the reason to exist? Like, um, why are they there? And those are things, you know, we can, uh, that were discussed in the, uh, world building video. Uh, but an important element, and this is going to come up later of why I'm discussing characters is because characters have goals. Uh, characters are often trying to do something, even if that something is to completely avoid the plot. Like, let's say, you know, there's a dragon rampaging through the city and, um, you know, somebody needs to kill this dragon, but the players don't want to engage with that uh, plot device or, you know, that um, dragon at all. Their goal is not to get involved in that. And their goal, you know, might be trying to not do something. Uh, so however you look at it, characters will have goals. Um, some will be very apparent of like, I want to be the best bard in the world, or, uh, you know, I want to nobody to ever see, you know, me again. Uh, could be a goal that this uh, character has. Um, why uh, that is important because you if uh, oftentimes your party uh, you'll have an idea of who's going to be your party and your players uh, before you know you start prepping a uh, campaign um, most of the time I'll have uh, a whole party together of uh, players and like what are you rolling up what are you rolling up what are you rolling up and after I have all of that it's when I'll start making the arc of my uh, campaign and to have like a loose idea of their goals but even if you don't have your players goals in mind it's good to have the goals of the characters around your players in mind because uh one thing you're going to find about every campaign is it evolves organically there is uh, only so much you can prep for a campaign um and the rest of it will just come naturally uh to like as as the players are playing and as uh, the story is unfolding. And all you need to do is have the bones of an outline there. And those bones of an outline are going to be your characters with goals around the party. Uh, if one character wants to become, you know, like the richest merchant in the world and the party standing next to her at the start of the campaign, you know, if they like her or if they dislike her, a very easy influencer on the arc of your campaign could be, you know, them working against her or working for her and uh, that shaping, um, you know, what's uh, moving forward. So moving forward, we're uh, going to be talking about moving. Characters move. Um, if not physically, then they move mentally and morally. Uh, and every character is going to step into the setting with some predefined ideology or some men some idea of who they are. Uh, it's your job as a dungeon master to identify what that is and uh, challenge it. Um, and you don't have to break the character's ideology. Sometimes you can reinforce it. Uh, and so they don't always, you know, move away from their I ideology. They may move deeper into it. Uh, but if your characters are the exact same characters from the moment the uh, campaign starts to the moment the campaign ends, uh, that's when you're looking at an issue. Um, so those characters that you've placed around the players as you're prepping for uh, the campaign, you need to uh, be conscious of giving them space to move. Uh, give them space to move uh, morally, uh, physically, or uh, mentally. Evil to good, lawful to chaotic, um, or, you know, have the chance to fall to temptation and resist. It's uh, as simple as that. Alright, so moving on from characters, the second thing we said that was important about a campaign campaign prepping is uh, conflict. Um, so your campaign is always going to develop organically. Your characters will decide what their own goals are most of the time if you let them. Um, and that is not to say that you don't need to put any conflict in front of them. Uh, because once again, at the heart of storytelling is conflict. 
So I'm just going to give you an example and then um, we'll uh, discuss it uh, more as ideas come to my head. So let's say there is a uh, volcano uh, on this island and somebody is manipulating that volcano to explode. Um, you don't have to start the campaign with your character's goal to be to stop that person from um, having the volcano explode in this region. So if you let the players just uh, into the world and interact and um, play off of the character's goals and uh, motives and let them move about, uh, you're going to find your story evolving around this volcano. So you don't have to prep that whole arc of the campaign because your characters might get into this world and or your players might get into this world and decide, you know what, we don't want to, like, we're not capable of stopping that person on the volcano or that's too risky. What we really want to do is focus on this village here and evacuate all these people, you know, or we can't stop this person on the volcano, but we can, you know, avenge and kill him later after, you know, this horrible act that he's done. Uh, or, you know, we want to prevent the volcano from exploding. You know, let's work to uh, stop that. Or, you know, they can even flip up and say, you know, we want to control the volcano ourselves. And um, that conflict of just this volcano is threatening this region uh, is a tertiary force. And what your characters want to do about it becomes the campaign. Uh, they don't have to necessarily solve it, but the things that your conflict affects uh, can become, you know, the arc of the, the campaign. Uh, the volcano explodes and, you know, half a town is like uh, buried in lava and the other half can't get past this magma wall. You know, the characters meet somebody who lost a child and now their campaign is, you know, traveling around this world to get to the other side of the region to find that child for the... Uh, for the NPC and bring it back. Um, your campaign uh, is not your conflict, but your conflict will shape your campaign. Uh, it's a squares and rectangles type of thing. All right, so moving on from there, uh, prepping a campaign. Uh, next we have setting. This is the one we're gonna dwell the least on because we've already dwelled the most on it. Uh, one thing that's very important that I preach about, and uh, this also reflexes back to conflict, you need to think about your setting like a character. You need to think of your conflict like a character, and this is why I put characters first. And we're going to touch back on conflict right here because I did forget to mention this. This is why I put characters first, because um, you need to give your uh your conflict often has roots in the world of what's leading up to it. Uh, as the conflict happening doesn't exist, you know, before the story, but what leads up to it exists before the story begins. Just like characters have backstory, conflict has backstory and history of what's causing it. Um, your conflict has a goal of, you know, it going off. You know, the volcano exploding is the goal of, you know, the agitated volcano. Um, and of course, you know, your conflict is going to move. You need to think about your setting in the same way that you think about your conflict or your characters of um, giving it backstory, personality, uh, having goals and, you know, your setting moving and the world uh, changing. I've, did, I've done a small video on this and I'll link it and that's why we're not going to dwell too much on setting because I don't want to rehash what I've already uh, said in other videos. Um, but a little tip that I don't know if I said there that I will put here. Uh, I said you need to give it uh, personality. And one thing um, that's really going to help when uh, thinking of your setting and conflict in this way is um, think of it like how you describe a person. Uh, in your most uh, basic terms, um, and this is going to get really shallow, you can call your setting, is it pretty or is it ugly? You know, is your conflict pretty or is it ugly? You know, is it nice or is it harsh? Is it mean? Um, and those can be things that can define the whole tone and flavor 
of the campaign that you're um, pushing forward to set with that one word in mind of just like, all right, how would I visually describe, you know, my setting, com my setting, my conflict, or even my characters for my campaign uh, if they were, you know, actual people I was looking at. All right. So, your characters will form uh, the campaign, and that's about all the work you need to do into, uh, prepping a, um, into prepping a campaign, is putting interesting characters with goals around your players, um, with a conflict that's affecting all of those characters in a setting that you have built that um, exists as a not fully fleshed out world, but a world with some sort of flavor that will move in a direction. So now we're going to talk about actually getting into the session and uh, prepping that. And I know I've been like, uh, you've just been staring at me here. Um, we're going to talk about what goes into session prep. And I have lots of stuff um, prepared for this. Uh, let me look at how much time we're doing. Okay, cool. We're uh, still good on time. Uh, that's going to be the uh, first thing I uh, discuss. Um, we'll look at the tools later, but first you need to establish how much time you have to uh, prep a session. And this was uh, the, the done the best, and I believe um, three edition 3.5 of D and D, the second Dungeon Masters, uh, the second Dungeon Masters uh, guide, and. I am uh, trying to remember the exact wording or if that's the place from it, but they have a table and uh, they uh, discuss in there um, how to prep a session depending on the time you have available. And uh, it always sucks that, you know, this didn't make it to like the main books of D&D uh, &D because this was the most helpful advice for me. Um, so we're going to uh, look at that of like, uh, what to do with 30 minutes, what to do with an hour, uh, what to do with, you know, three hours to, you know, a couple days. Um, from there, you know, we'll uh, talk about uh, NPCs, uh, and then, you know what, we'll just find out where we land. All right, so, um, on the time you have available, uh, we'll, we'll go from the uh, bottom to the top. So let's say you, and I'm going to give uh, actual examples of, um, I'm going to give actual examples um, from the uh, campaigns that I am running. So uh, if you followed the last steps of the campaign prep, uh, for actually prepping for your campaign, you should have some characters in mind, a conflict in mind, and a setting. How that normally plays out for me is I uh, have these handy dandy note cards, and uh, I'm going to uh, move this closer to the thing. I just need to. So, um, for me, I have these uh, handy dandy note cards. Uh, I have what I do is the type of campaign I'm running. It is a political thriller. Uh, I have my setting, um, Ardor Serai, which is a nation in my world, and I have uh, my conflict uh, right here of different force forces are vying for control of Ardor. Um, on the uh, back, I have uh, my characters involved, and then uh, on the front, I have an idea of um, the settings that this uh, might take me to uh, with different with different uh, areas listed of where Act 1 of the uh, campaign is going to happen, Act 2 of the campaign is going to happen, and Act 3 of the campaign is going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen in those acts, but I have a general idea of um, if all of these things are interacting, you know, where are the players going? Um, from there, I have uh, several NPCs that I've written down. Uh, that have stakes in the world uh, for what they're doing. The other thing that you might have saw on here, and I'm just explaining this in depth before I go to this uh, next um, slide that sounds like a presentation. Um, you saw I had a couple of numbers on here. I have a world map uh, set, 
and uh, there's distance between um, these places. So I have, uh, I measure out that distance of just like, oh, it's eight hexes, that's, you know, this amount of days of travel time. So all in all, this campaign is going to take place, and if they have to get from here to here, it's going to take place in, you know, this span of time. And I don't always stick to that, but it's just uh, nice um, for preparing. Um, so what I just showed you was a Group D. It's a campaign I'm running called Brothers in Arms, and it's uh, here on the channel. You know, you can go uh, click the links and um, find out uh, things about that. Uh, watch their sessions. But yeah, it is a very interesting political thriller. And um, I'm going to show you one of the uh, preps that I've done for one of their recent campaigns. So let's say you have the absolute minimum amount of time to uh, prep for a campaign with all those things coming together. What I like to do is I'll write out the events um, that these NPCs around, uh, around the players would would be happening to those interesting characters that I've placed. And if the players have an opportunity to interact with any of them, you know, I'll have them in my notes right there. So uh, what I normally do is I think of, um, oh gosh, <laughs> I think of three ideas. Of, I try and have three events for every session. I will have one role play event that is completely involved with characters talking to other characters. I have one world event of things happening in the world around the players, like the volcano erupting of a conflict that affects a variety of people and let the players, you know, be able to respond to that. And I'll have one combat, um, I'll, well, normally I'll have about one combat event rolled up. Lately I've been doing uh, two roleplay events, one world event, and then a combat event every other session uh, prepped. But um, I'll have one combat event of just like, if, you know, like the players stumble into this situation, you know, here is a uh, combat event. Um, and so uh, this is the absolute base level of, you know, you're running out of time, how I prep this uh, session. Um, so I'll just have a few notes to remind me of, um, I'll have a few notes to remind me of what those events are moving around the players. So my uh, RP event, the players went to a jail to talk with a um, with a deity in hiding by the name of Gale Song. Uh, that's Storm's Nest Gale Song, and uh, I will have that in my notes of just like, oh yeah, that's a thing that can happen. And as the session's going on, you know, I'll be thinking of things uh, to be involved with that. And I'll put NPCs in front of them that, you know, may suggest that course of action to push towards that event. The other thing happening in the world is uh, the, mag the leader of this country was killed. And there's, going there's a funeral that's going to be held for him. Um, so that is just an event that is happening in the world if the players choose to explore the world. Uh, this session, actually session 11, is on um, the is on my YouTube page, and you can see that if you've watched it, that event did not happen because you know the players didn't um, go and uh, explore the world. They had very direct things that they were doing. Another player is um, another thing I had prepped was a uh, another player is investigating. Um, the disappearance of his, uh, of one of his allies, and, uh, she's leaving cryptic clues for him as she can't overtly, uh, engage him and, you know, tell him what's going on, uh, but of, like, what happened to her. And so, I just have these notes, uh, very quickly for me, so they can be, like, uh, churning in my head, but I don't want to, I don't have the time to prep uh, every single one of these events moving into the session, if I'm doing this, you know, uh, 30 to 10 minutes before a session. So, as you can see on this list, two, three of these events didn't even get handled uh, for that session. So, I saved myself time of just like, this is what I am capable of uh, doing here. Uh, moving on, uh, next, if you have about an hour of time, um, this is another way I prep my sessions. Uh, this is for uh, Group B, and same thing, I have the campaign card for them, uh, overall of, you know, what their campaign's moving towards. Uh, but what I'll take and do for uh, getting ready for the session 
is I will write out, um, and this is when I have 30 minutes to an hour, I'll write out the uh, setting, you know, if there's something important in the setting, like uh, they're in the Darius, uh, the Darius uh, Desert, and our Darius Desert, I always pronounce that wrong and I made the word. They're in the Darius Desert and um, there is this massive holy burning earth fire there that is a very important element of our story and like and what's happening in the campaign and it lights up the night around it and that if you're in the desert the sun set and it's you know it's just uh nothing but stars and black sky overhead of you the horizon's actually lit with this massive burning white divine fire if you're close enough to it so uh, as it being an important element of the story and, you know, this, uh, f like, feature of the desert, uh, beforehand I wrote out a, a description of it because I wanted to make sure I did that element of the story in the world justice. So the description says, you know, it's known as, um, the Earth's fire is known as the White Sands. Looking at it, you know, a cloud of dim white light illuminates the lower horizon of the sky like an out of sight uh, pale full moon. It looks like the light of a thousand shimmering stars have coalesced and decided to burn just over the horizon. That's not something I can on the mark come up with right off the top of my head, but it is, you know, the flavor of this world of what's going on there. And so that I took time before the session and I wrote it out. So looking on um, more onto this, uh, there was a town uh, relatively close to where the players um, were at called Murkwaters that they had never been to. Um, Murkwaters has a whole storyline going on with it. So having just an hour to prep, I couldn't prep the entire town. Um, but what I could do is prep the characters that were important to the story. Uh, to the town. So, there uh, Merc Waters, it ha give it a line of description of just like, this is going on inside of the town. And then, uh, out of uh, those, I, you know, put several NPCs here of just like, these are the NPCs they're going to interact with. Uh, and then, just like the Earth Fire, as it is, you know, something that's important to uh, the setting and the storyline, I wrote out, um, a, a description of the town because I had the time to and I wanted to you know make sure I was doing this justice before the story or you know before the session began um, and then uh, in this region too uh, just like before in the other document there are other things happening that I don't have the time to prepare everything for so just north of this town there is a war going on for a large forest so just like I did on the other document, I just made notes to remind me of what is happening in that forest, um, in case that it become in case it becomes a thing that you know the players uh, move towards. And they uh, actually did go towards the forest of Yan Baharad. So you can see how uh, this uh, amount of prep right here became irrelevant for um, the rest of the session. But it wasn't wasted because I can still bring it back later. Uh, but also, you know, I was able to, in my last bit of time, go through and prep uh, to have a little bit of extra content prepared for the players in case they wander in that other direction. And um, once again, if you uh, just look at the, if you just look at what we initially said of let's putting interesting characters with goals around the players. Uh, conflict in the region and a setting that you know has flavor uh, the story will evolve itself and even though I didn't have like much uh, to do in the forest of Yan uh the players actually spent two sessions there uh, and are you know still just north of there now uh, moving on from that, let's say you have a lot of time to prep for a session uh, an hour to three hours um, this is how I prep my more in-depth sessions, and what I will take and do is, um, I'll still have my events of what's going to happen, uh, and how my characters are interacting with each other. Uh, this is for, um, group C, and, um, 
I actually had enough time for this session beforehand that I could go in and prepare dialogue for each of the characters. Of like, okay, the characters have told me they want to go to this place. So when they go to this place, this character is going to be inside of that place. Um, just like we said before with characters, the characters exist before the camera's on them. The characters exist before the settings on them. So what type of scene are they walking into? You know, what do the players see when they walk in this place? And I'll have, uh, descriptions and dialogues of, like, what's going on, um, for them, uh, in, written out to such a way, uh, and this is a per session basis. I don't, as you can see, I don't do this every single session. You know, some sessions are like this. A lot of sessions are like this. Uh, and then some sessions are in depth with uh, actual dialogue and everything uh, going on. And then just like before, um, the players may completely change course on you. Uh, putting interesting NPCs around the players with um, goals of, that exist in the world conflict moving all of them in your setting uh, in case they ever go anyplace else you can just roll up a couple other things of just all right well there's a you know players like taverns what's the tavern look like here what's the rest of the city look like uh and just you know describe it in one word it's ugly you know well why and then when you start asking why and the players are exploring this uh, those are things that can develop. Well, if it's ugly, you know, because of its, uh, the criminal world, is it ugly because they engage in slave trading? Is it ugly because they just experienced a war? Um, and those are all things that are going to develop, uh, throughout your campaign. Um, but the main thing to take away is don't feel like you have to do this type of prep every session. Um, Find what works for you. Some players work best off of, you know, off of this right here. Uh, personally, I work best off of uh, about minimum in information and just letting everything else um, grow. Uh, so, how do you let things grow? And that's going to be the final thing uh, we discuss today. And I'm going to give you your most important tools of uh, GMing. And we'll go back to uh, the big camera as uh, I like to say, and uh, we'll uh, take up this whole page. There we go. Um, I'm gonna give you your most important element of uh, dungeon mastering, your NPC sheet. So beforehand, um, and this actually goes into uh, prepping, and this will help you let the story grow. Um, I, uh, and every dungeon master should do this, I write down a sheet with about uh, 20 names on it of just random NPC names. Um, and I'll show you what a less filled out one looks like. Of just, I just put a bunch of names that are, in, that are popular in the region. And when the players go into something that I have not prepared and they meet and talk to somebody, I will pick a name off of this list at random of just like, Oh, this person. And then, uh, like, you know, we want to go talk to a blacksmith. And I will say, okay, well, you find a blacksmith. His name is Rotero. In my notes, I will put, you know, uh, under this, like, area where I have a uh, name listed, I'll put a uh, blacksmith that this group talked to. And then if they ever want to go back and talk to that NPC, um... I can look at this note and remember, like, oh yeah, that guy is there. Or, um, you can, uh, develop and flush out these characters more in the future. And I'll give you an example of a, uh, of a campaign growing. Um, I'm looking for one that is relevant. Okay, here we go. Um, on my uh, first NPC sheet, the players met a character named Typhus Seasons. Um, he was not any specific character that I had rolled up initially. What was going on was um, they 
wanted to meet with a member of the Ethics Council. And so I, you know, uh, looked at the name Typhus, became the person. Um, as the players go on, like this was a minor NPC, as the players go on about their campaign, uh, suddenly the Ethics Council becomes relevant again and the trial of another character that other players caused her to lose her station. And the Ethics Council was involved in judging if she, if that character would be executed or not. And suddenly Typhus became more relevant. Because the decision the players made there and that minor, um, and that minor moment of, you know, talking to Typhus, uh, suddenly, you know, this character's going on trial. They come back around into interaction with, uh, Typhus. He, uh, defends, uh, this character. He is a, um, Typhus becomes, you know, this figure of, um, this morally grounded figure within the, uh, eyes of the player and the eyes of the world, uh, because of him voting in this, uh, or because of, like, his defense in this, um, trial. And so later on, the story keeps going, and um, the council of advisors to the nation's ruler is killed. They're all killed. And uh, the council needs to be populated with more people with morally sound judgment to advise the ruler. And who has developed in the story as a character randomly that has morally sound judgment? Well, Typhus has came back around as a high counselor, and he's relevant in the story. And the campaign has just grown in a way that that's not something that I planned. But because of the actions of the characters, uh, this character Typhus himself having, um, when I placed him, you know, having uh, existing in the world before the camera ever um, ever shined on him, like he was a ethics council, uh, was an ethics counselor. Um, having a goal of, you know, morally uh, making sound judgments that affect other people, and the character moved in a way that he grew beyond his station, uh, the conflict of the assassins killing the High Council, and the setting that, you know, the High Council is needed to advise the leader, has led to the, uh, has led to uh, story elements of the campaign developing and growing in such a way that all of this is moving forward in a way that feels very organic. Um, and just allowing yourself uh, that freedom of allowing things to grow, having your NPC sheet in front of you with, you know, characters with unlisted, um, with unlisted details that you can fill out as they're needed is going to help you get to that moment of allowing your characters to grow. And so, we talked about characters, and I always say, think about your setting uh, and your conflict as a character itself. So not only do I have those character sheets, but I will have um, seats, sheets for my city, uh, with my city's uh, personality on it, um, you know, of that ugly, that ugly, pretty, um, nice, uh, mean uh, description on it of just very short and very brief. And as the care, as the players explore different parts of the city, I'll have labeled um, that you know these roads exist in the city, uh, these neighborhoods exist in the city. And then as they find, like as they want to do things, like oh, I want to go to a library. Well, I didn't place a library in this city. Um, but the city would have a library. It would be in this area. I will write, you know, the library is in Shields Way. Uh, well, Shields Way is the name of the road, the region of the city, but you get the picture. <laughs> and so the cities develop organically, uh, just like your uh, campaign does. And you can go through and prep and put every building in the city if you have the time for it. But if you take away anything from this video, it's that find what works for you and then do that. Um, so hopefully some of the information here has been useful. Um, if you like this video, I'll be doing one for players. Uh, this one was mostly for Dungeon Masters and uh, getting ready for a campaign. I'll be doing one for players hopefully next week. Um, I am ADDing super hard, so I have like a bajillion ideas for videos. And I may just do a uh, random different one then. Uh, but otherwise, I just want to say thank you for watching. Um, 
I've been me, and uh, yeah, thank you to the patrons that make this video possible. Uh, thank you for the people who like uh, Dungeons and Dragons content, and uh, we're gonna do a whole lot more of it. Peace!